The topic for today is income inequality. What's happened, why, and what should we do about it? Without further ado, please welcome in giving a big round of applause to Dr. Gregory Mankiw. Uh, thank you. It's a great honor and a delight to be here to talk to you. The topic for today is income inequality. I'm going to divide the presentation in three parts. What are the facts? What are some of the hypotheses to uh, um, explain these facts? And what are we going to do about, about this, if anything? The general public's discussion of income inequality, I think, really took a starting point. It really, it really took a turn for being more active at this moment from the 2008 campaign. This is then-candidate uh, um, Barack Obama meeting somebody in the campaign trail, a guy who got nicknamed Joe the Plumber. And Joe the Plumber said he was running a plumbing business and wanted to know why Barack Obama wanted to raise his taxes. And Joe the Plumber said, I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. And that really has set the tone, I think, for the general discussion of income inequality over the past uh, six years. Uh, now, economists, of course, have been thinking about this topic much longer, and, and some of the research I'm going to talk to you about today began well before this moment. But I think the general public got more interested in the general topic uh, really at, at this time and, and, and since... since uh, President Obama moved into the White House. So let me start off with just reviewing the facts. I'm sure that you were seeing these elsewhere, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page so we know what we're, we're talking about. This is a graph here from two of my colleagues, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. And what they've done here is graph the growth in average income for the five different quintiles of the income distribution, and also for the top 5%, which is on the far right, before and after 1973. So the light <laughs> bars on the left show you the growth rates before 73. And what you see there is that the growth was pretty uniform across the income distribution. We see 25 to 3% growth across the board. And indeed, the, the bars on the left are a little bigger than the bars on the right, meaning that growth in the bottom quintiles was a little bit higher than growth in the top quintiles. And as a result, during this period, from roughly World War II to sometime in the mid-1970s, income equality was increasing. We were getting more equal as a, as a society. The dark bars show you the growth of those quintiles since 1973, and here you see a staircase where there was growth at the bottom, but it was relatively meager, and there's much more rapid growth at the top. And as a result, since the 70s, we've been in a period of inc increasing inequality. Notice the top 5% is particularly taken off, but even across the whole spectrum, but this is not just a phenomenon at the very top, throughout the spectrum we see that the higher income quintiles experience more rapid growth than the lower, lower income quintiles. Now, there's been a lot of interest, not just in the overall distribution of income, but in the very, very top of the distribution. So this tells you the percentage of total income going to the top 1%. This data comes from work by... Uh, Piketty and Saez, using income tax returns. If you want to study the very, very wealthy, income tax returns are a natural place to look. They probably don't show up in great numbers in other surveys. If you call up Bill Gates on the phone and ask him about his income, he's probably not going to answer your survey question. So if you, but when the IRS asks similar questions, he, he is more likely to actually answer. So here, this shows you the income share, the top 1%. And to get the top 1% today, you need more than $394,000 of income. And what we see here is increasing inequality since the 1970s. So in 1973, we see that the top 1% earned about 9% of income. Today it earns about 20, 22% of income. So we see that the share going to the top 1% has more than doubled. This next graph shows you the income of the 1% of the 1%. So this is a very rarefied group of people. These people to get to this top 0.01% of the income distribution, you need income today of more than $10 million a year. So to give you some 
sense of that, the median CEO of an S&P 500 company earns about $10 million a year. So basically only half of the CEOs make this. So this is a very, very small group. It's about 15,000 households a year. And again, we see a tremendous increase in the share of income going at the top. So in the 1970s, we see that this group earned about 1% of income, and today they earn about 5% of income. So their share of income has increased about fivefold. And because of this increasing inequality, we've experienced relatively small progress against poverty. This, the bottom graph here shows you the poverty rate since 1959. And what you see is that from 59 to the mid-70s, the poverty rate is experiencing this gradual decline. This one was when, Robert, when John Kennedy could say a rising tide raised all ships, and that seemed to be about right. As economic growth raised all income levels, more and more people were pushed above the poverty line and fewer people were left below it. But since the 1970s, even though we've been experiencing growth in average incomes, we see that the poverty rate has been more or less flat. It tends to rise in recessions, which are the shaded areas, and fall in booms. But the overall long-term trend suggests that there really has been very little change in average poverty uh, since the 1970s. And that is really quite a bleak picture. But to give you a somewhat more hopeful sign, this shows you world poverty, which of course is defined very differently. When people talk about poverty around the world, they look at people li living at less than a dollar a day, adjusted for inflation. And you see that there's been tremendous advances during this period in re reducing world poverty. More than a quarter of the population in 1970 was in the world was living at less than a dollar a day. Now it's down to about 5%. The major growth of, the, the major advances in world poverty have come from Asia, in particular rapid growth in um, China and India. And what we see here is that, that Asia has experienced tremendous reductions in poverty rates. Part of the world that has not experienced similar reductions in poverty is Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this is, of course, good news for people worried about global poverty, that Asia's experienced this rapid growth, but this doesn't really provide a lot of solace to the typical American voter. If we tell the typical American voter that we're experiencing increasing inequality and, therefore, very small reductions in poverty rates, telling the voter, but don't worry, people in China are doing just fine, <laughs> that's not going to make the voter feel much better. From a cosmopolitan global perspective, we can take very much comfort in this, but obviously this doesn't mean that the problem in the United States uh, uh, doesn't have to be paid attention to. Okay, so those are the facts about income inequality. I think those are relatively well known. Uh, I just wanted to review them to make sure that we sort of we were basically on the same page. You knew roughly what I was talking about. I'd like to say an aside about mobility. This is obviously a different issue than inequality. Inequality is how dispersed the income distribution is. Mobility is how much do people move through it from generation to generation. Uh, but I do want to say an aside about mobility, because this, these two topics are obviously intertwined. Now, when we think about mobility, I think it's a situation where the glass is half full and the glass is half empty. There's some mobility, but not perfect mobility. So I want to start off by gauging how much mobility there is. So I want you, you would all to answer a question for yourselves. Let's imagine that you're the 99th percentile. So you're in the top 1%. You make the $400,000 a year. <laughs> Where, where in this income distribution do you expect your children to be when they are adults? If we lived in a completely static world where there was no mobility, you'd say, well, they're in the 99th percentile too. If we lived in a world of perfect mobility, so there's no correlation between parents and children, then your best guess for your children would be the middle, 50th percentile. Obviously, we live somewhere in between. Right? It's, it's lower than 99, but higher than 50. So I want you to think to yourself, where do you think it is? How much mobility do you think it is? You're in the top 1%. What's your best guess is where your kids are going to be? Right now, write it down and think to yourself what your number is going to be. Okay? I want to take a vote in just a second. I'll see a show of hands. I'm going to show you the facts. Then you got to tell me honestly how, how you did. Okay? So here are the facts. This is from a paper by Raj Chetty, a young superstar economist at Harvard. Uh, he's writing a lot of really fascinating papers on this and related topics. And here's a regression relating the income rank of a child once they're an adult to the income rank of the parent. 
And you see the slope of this line is about 0.3. And the main purpose of this paper was to show that there has not been large changes over time. So they estimate the slope over different time periods. It's basically the same. But what I want to talk to you about now is the magnitude of inequality. If you're at the 99th percentile, so you're at the far right of this graph, go up to where the value is, and you look over and say, oh, my kids are going to be at the 65th percentile. Now raise your hand if you thought the number was going to be below 65. One person, two people. Who thought the number was going to be above 65? Raise your hand. Exactly. Almost every time I give this talk and show this graph, the vast majority of people expect the number to be bigger than 65. They, or to put it another way, when Chetty studies the data on income mobility, he finds more mobility than most people think. Now, we can all think of examples of people who have been very mobile. I'm personally less surprised by these numbers because I came, I've been very lucky to be fairly mobile. My four grandparents all came here from Ukraine around 100 years ago, none of them with more than a fourth grade education. My parents grew up poor in New Jersey but did manage to graduate from high school, did not go to college. And here I am, a Harvard professor. So wait, I've, been, I've, been, I've experienced this upward mobility. Um, but I think that now that I'm towards the top of the distribution, I have to worry about the other thing, which is downward mobility. What this graph is telling me is that my children are likely to regress toward the mean. <laughs> Some, something to give pause. Now, one of the questions you might ask is, okay, why is there any correlation at all between parents' income and children's income? And it's, of course, a classic question of nature versus nurture. One answer is that, well, if, you're, if you have high income, you can hire SAT tutors for your kids, you can move to nice neighborhoods where they've got good schools, you can send them to great summer camps, you can buy them lots of books. But there's another way in which you matter to your kids. You pass on your genes. And you have a bunch of characteristics that may have been passed on to them. Maybe you're smart. Maybe you're lucky, you look like George Clooney. <laughs> Maybe you have self-control. Maybe you're hardworking. Some of these personality traits, or physical characteristic traits, are passed on through the genes. And to some extent, it's the genes that we're reflecting here, not the fact you're buying them the SAT tutors. How would we ever know the difference, which it is nature versus nurture? What you'd want to do is you want to take some children and randomly distribute them to people who are not biologically related to them, <laughs> And, and see, see how they see how their how, how their outcome was. Well, they've done that. There have been studies of adopted children. In fact, Bruce Sacerdote, a economist at Dartmouth, has studied Korean infants who were literally randomly distributed to people who wanted to adopt children, and so he could compare this this correlation, this relationship between parents and child's income for their biological children and for the adopted children. And what he found was that the relationship for the adopted children was much, much weaker. Which suggests that a large part of the relationship between uh, parents and children is, is genetic um, rather than the SAT tutors. And indeed, if you go to ETS and say, what's the value of an SAT tutor, they'll tell you, not much. Um, and I spent, I, as a parent of three kids, I spent lots of money on my kids, and I can, I, I'm not completely sure of the marginal value <laughs> of all those great, wonderful educational opportunities we're lavishing on them. Okay, so that's the only thing I'm going to say about mobility for today. I want to move on now to talking about hypotheses. Those are the facts as we know them. Um, I'm going to talk about why we think these facts are true. I'm going to talk about some of the true hypotheses and some of the false hypotheses that, that people put forward. I want to start off with several hypotheses that I do think have some degree of truth to them. Uh, and why? Now, I should note, by the way, that we probably shouldn't look for a single explanation for this phenomenon of rising inequality. There's probably lots of things going on in the economy that's contributing <coughs> to this trend. And income is a, some product of lots of different f economic phenomena. So I think all of these things have some element of truth. Now, the first one I want to talk about is data problems. Whenever we look at data, we can ask ourselves, is it really trustworthy data? Are we really getting at what we want it to get at? And there's two problems I want to highlight in particular. I'm sure there's others that I'll highlight in particular I think are important in looking at these data. One is that when we look at data on things like income, we usually omit 
fringe benefits. Certainly, look at tax return data, they get admitted because they're not part of taxes. They're not taxable income. But even some of the cash income the Census Bureau looks at admits fringe benefits. And fringe benefits have become an increasingly large share of compensation. It's grown from about 8% in 1960 to about 20% today. And that wouldn't be a problem if fringe benefits were proportional to income. So looking at income, you sort of got the same phenomena. But they're not. The CEO may make 100 times as much as the typical worker in his company, but the value of his health plan is not 100 times the value of the health plan. The health plan is going to be much more similarly distributed. So we're, we're missing a piece of, of um, compensation that's growing in importance and distributed very differently than the cash compensation we do measure. So I think that is potentially quite important. Uh, CBO data, by the way, takes, tries to take this into account uh, the, best, the best they can. There's another problem that's also important, which is that when you look at tax return data, there are changes in the tax code that change the way income is reported. So we, and remember, the IRS, when Congress makes tax law, the IRS enforces tax law, they're not doing it to construct a consistent data series to measure inequality over time. It turns out collects tax revenue. And they're constantly changing the tax code, and as a result, the data source is going to change in nature. And they don't go back and try to revise your old tax returns to make it on a consistent basis, like the GDP does, the BA does when they revise the definition of GDP. They just, the old tax data is whatever it is, and they leave it there. And one of the big changes we've seen over time is the rise of pass-through entities. That is, some business income is reported as a, on a corporate tax return, a C-corp, but other business income is reported on individual returns because you have an S-corp or a limited liability corporation. And here shows you the decline of C-corps over time, which is the big thing at the bottom, and the rise of pass-through entities, which are all the things in the top here. And so pass-through entities have gotten increasingly important over this period of time, basically because tax laws has encouraged people to do the pass-through entities. To give you a particular concrete example of this, the Johnson family in Boston owns Fidelity, the mutual fund giant. Some years ago, they were a C-corporation, they decided, as the tax law changed, that it was advantageous for them to become a pass-through entity. And as a result, they restructured the company as a pass-through entity. So all of a sudden, all the income that the Johnsons were earning who were previously on their C-Corp tax return are now on their personal tax returns. That change, of course, doesn't necessarily make them more wealthy. It just means that the income is showing up in a different place. It's going to look like increasing inequality, even if it's really just a change in reporting. This one, I think, has not been looked at a lot. I should note, by the way, that this just was at CBO today talking to them about this, and their data on inequality also suffers from this problem, as well as the um, piketty uh, Saez uh, data. This is a hard one to get at, but it's probably particularly important if you're looking at the very, very rich. If you're looking at the 1% or the 1% of the 1%, my guess is these past two entities are pretty important. I mean, there's only 15,000 people in the 1% of the 1%, so the Johnson family by themselves loom pretty large in that. Um, and, and it's not just the Johnson family, it's, it's, it's business income in general has been moving to this other form, showing up personal returns. So I think there's good reason to be skeptical about some of the data we see all the time. Now, I don't want to say that different inequality is not rising. I think it probably is. We have other sources of data, and I think inequality is rising. But some of the specific data we see and some of the most striking numbers we see, I think, may be seriously infected by some of these data flaws. Okay. Data problems are hypothesis one. Another explanation is what my colleagues Claudia Golden and Larry Katz in their book called The Race Between Education and Technology. And here's their story. Golden and Katz say that technology always increases the demand for skilled workers and tends to replace and therefore reduce the, the demand for unskilled workers. So you think, well, you know, when I first entered the economics profession, one of the big things about writing a paper was getting a good typist, right? Do you remember that? You used to have to hire it. You know, when you're writing your dissertation, I got to find a typist to type it. Somebody actually do the technical typing. Who does that now? Everybody types their own papers in their word processor. So the demand for typists goes down. The productivity of the researcher goes up. In the old days, when you went to a parking lot, you always had somebody there collecting the money. Now they're just machines that are there collecting the money. So technological progress has reduced the demand for the unskilled labor and tends to increase the demand for skilled labor. Now, if that's the case, why is it that we experienced a period from World War II to um, the 1970s of increasing equality? Well, Golden and Katz say, it's true that technology was pushing us toward inequality, 
but the educational system was pushing the other direction and winning the race. And then things changed. So here's a picture from their, their, their studies. This shows the number of years of schooling by year of birth for adult workers. And you see that there's an upward trend. If you were born in 1875, you probably had only about seven years of schooling. And then and that number could, went up pretty steadily throughout the 20th century. But sometime around the cohort born in 1950, there's a bit of a kink. This keeps rising, but it stops rising at the same rate. If it had kept rising at the same rate it had been, the average American worker would have two more years of schooling than, in fact, they do. So what does this mean? It means that in this race between education and technology, education started losing and technology started winning. And we entered a period of, of, of rising inequality as, as skilled workers tended to experience higher wages relative to unskilled workers. This shows you, this more concretely, which shows you the growth of earnings of workers, full-time workers, by how much education they have. Men are on the left, women are on the right. Tell a similar story. If you're a high school dropout, which is the bottom line here, what you see is you basically had flat earnings since 1963. If you have a bachelor's degree, you experienced roughly 40% increase in earnings, or, or 60% for... <laughs> Um, for women. If you have an advanced degree, your earnings have gone up about 90% since 19, 1963. So we see a tremendous difference in what's happened to earnings as a function of education during this period. Globalization is hypothesis number three. And I'm sure you've heard this story a lot. People worry about trade with low wage countries like China. They worry about its impact on the unskilled workers here. And the basic economics of this is pretty straightforward. If we import goods produced with unskilled workers abroad, that reduces the demand for unskilled workers here and tends to depress their wages. Similarly, if we export <coughs> goods produced with skilled workers, that tends to raise the demand for skilled workers and raise their wages here. So we're basically importing T-shirts and exporting software that makes that, that's good for our software engineers, but bad for our textile workers. And that increase in trade with low-wage countries, the argument goes, increases inequality quality in the United States. That may well be a contributing factor. So I put on my list of things that may well be going on. I don't think it's the main contributing factor. If it were, what would be going on in China? China would be experiencing just the opposite because they'd be importing stuff produced by skilled workers, the software, and exporting stuff produced by unskilled workers, the t-shirts, and as a result, the demand for unskilled workers would be rising, and the demand for skilled workers there would be falling, and we should be seeing increasing equality in China. Right? But since they have the opposite pattern of trade than we have, they should be experiencing the opposite inequality phenomenon. But in fact, inequality has been going up there as well. Inequ rising inequality is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just a U.S. phenomenon. It varies from country to country, but it's not the case that these low-wage countries that we're trading with have been experiencing increasing equality. And that suggests that what's going on is probably more likely driven by things like technology and not just trade in and of itself. Superstars. Sherman Rosen wrote a famous paper in 1981 talked about the certain kinds of markets that superstars would naturally develop. Imagine that you're the world's best plumber. Everybody may want you to be their plumber, but you can't be the whole world's plumber. Maybe you can charge more than a mediocre plumber, but you can't be a plumber to everybody. <coughs> so you charge a little more, you do a little better for being such a good plumber, but you, you talk, you, some people say, well, I'm not going to pay for him, he's a little too expensive, and besides, you can't go to everybody's house anyway. So if you're a mediocre plumber, you're probably doing okay because there's a lot of people out there that need plumbers. Suppose you're the world's best actor. Your name is Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> everybody wants to see your movies. Well, everybody can see your movies. It's not like the world's best plumber where you're limited. You're Robert Downey Jr., you make a movie and it gets sent around the world. For the movie The Avengers... Robert Downey, when he played Iron Man, 
I'm sure you've seen the Iron Man movies. The first one's the best, by the way. Um, <laughs> the Avengers was pretty good, too. But for the movie The Avengers, he was paid $50 million. So basically, that's what five CEOs would make in a year. Typical CEOs would make in a year. For one movie, $50 million. Now, it's not like the producers lost money. It was a very successful movie, very profitable movie. <laughs> But to give you broad numbers, roughly 200 million people saw the movie around the world. Each of them paid other uh, ticket price, 25 cents went to Robert Downey Jr. I'm guessing most of the people left the movie theater saying, yeah, that was a pretty good movie. Yeah, and Robert Downey Jr. did a pretty good job. I'm happy to pay him 25 cents to, to, for that performance. <laughs> so that's how a superstar can develop. Now, if you're a mediocre actor, what do you do? You're probably a waiter <laughs> and, and, or some other profession, and maybe you're acting on weekends in community theater just for fun as a hobby. Right? The mediocre plumber does just fine because the superstar plumber can't service everybody. <coughs> the mediocre actor doesn't do so well because the superstar actor can service everybody. And the, and the argument, which is very hard to quantify, but I think it's very plausible, is so we're increasingly moving toward an economy where there's more and more services that are described as a superstar kind of phenomena, where somebody has a fixed cost, and then their product can be distributed around the world at very low marginal costs. It's acting, it's software, it's music, economics textbooks. <laughs> Sadly, not as many people read economics textbooks as have seen the Avengers, <laughs> but I'm working on that. <laughs> okay. The women's movement and assorted of mating. This is one I love talking to about my Harvard students. I tell my Harvard students that, yes, Harvard is an elite educational institution, but it's also the world's best dating service. We, we are very selective at who we, who we match you with at Harvard. It's very hard to get in. Um, so if, you're in the meet, if, you're, if you come to Harvard, uh, not only should you take some good classes, it's a good, good opportunity to meet your spouse. Uh, I was actually a grad student at MIT. I met my spouse when she was a student at Harvard, uh, so it worked for me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it, it, I, I think in terms of thinking about economic inequality, thinking about talented people matching up with other talented people and that becoming increasingly important for income dynamics is a real phenomenon. And here's a paper from a sociology journal, a graph from the paper in a sociology journal. And the bottom line here, the, the dark dots, shows you for all couples the correlation between husbands' incomes and wives' incomes. I think, I think they took the CPS data. And for each year, they basically took, took a correlation between husbands' incomes and wives' incomes. Now, if you look today, which is the right-hand side of this chart, not surprisingly, it's positive. High-income husbands tend to have high-income wives and vice versa. That, that, that's not a shock. But notice that in the 1960s, there was a negative correlation. High-income husbands tend to have low-income wives. Now, to, to my students today, that seems odd. But I'm old enough to remember the 1960s. And why would that negative correlation came? Well, the, the, the role of women in society is very different than it is today. What would a high-income man do? They, he'd say, honey, you know, I make enough income now, you don't need to go to work. And so the higher the income of the husband, the less likely the woman was to stay in the workforce. And you can see that if you only look at dual learning couples, it was, it, that correlation was positive, which is the other one. But it's only for all couples, which includes non-working spouses, that you see the correlation is negative. So what does it mean when this correlation goes from negative to positive? It means that households now are increasingly dominated by, at the top, are dominated by two people who are earning high incomes, as opposed to one person earning high income and the other about staying at home. So I tell my students, look, if you're a Harvard student major in economics, you're going to leave, you're probably going to work at Kinsey or Goldman Sachs and make a lot of money. If you're really, really worried about income inequality, marry a poet. <laughs> because... You know, when you, if you will go to McKinsey or Goldman Sachs and you marry somebody else's work in McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, those are two high incomes put in one household, and that's increasing inequality in household incomes. Now, because those are I th I th the, some of, what I think are some of the true hypotheses that are, that are explaining what's going on in income inequality. I don't, I don't have an ability to sort out which is more important than others. I think the Golden and Katz one is particularly important, but as an economist, I don't think we've fully sorted out the relative importance of all these different forces at work. Let me talk about two false narratives that are popular, and I want to I, I mention them because you, you hear them a lot, and I, just, I think they're more wrong uh, than right. The first one has to do with CEOs. And the story that you hear often is that these CEOs of publicly traded companies are taking advantage of the system. 
They put their buddies on the board. Their buddies give them big raises. Uh, and, and really what the, the, the boards aren't doing is they're not looking out for the best interests of shareholders by overpaying the CEO, which is ripping off the shareholders and also leaving less money in the till for workers to, to get raises. Now, I don't believe that. Why don't I believe that? Well, we have a pretty interesting counterexample. We have a situation where there are not <coughs> corporate boards subject to this moral hazard problem, and those are private equity firms. Suppose you're a private equity firm, and you own the whole company, so you are hiring the CEO, and you are paying the CEO. Well, the CEO is getting paid your money. You have no reason to overpay the CEO. More than, you have no reason to pay them more than they're worth. And how much do they pay the CEOs? They pay them just as much as the public companies do. So if a private company, so their own money at stake, are paying CEOs this much as the public companies, it suggests that the public companies aren't making a mistake. Rather, it suggests that, these, that getting the right CEO really is valuable. And indeed, you might think of the CEO as a kind of superstar-like phenomenon where his talent is leveraging himself across the, across the world. False narrative number two. I'm sure some of you have seen this book. Uh, it's kind of amazing that a, a book, a, a very thick book about e economics becomes such a, a, a bestseller. I must confess, I feel a little bit of envy <laughs> ab about this. Like, I have to admit that. Uh, I'll never sell as many textbooks as Thomas Piketty has sold books of capital in the 21st century. I mean, I think there's a lot in the Piketty's book that is interesting and, and true, but I think the basic story that he tells about rising inequality is probably wrong. He spends a lot of time talking about the relationship between the rate of return on capital, R, and the growth rate of the economy, G. He calls R, bigger than G, the central contradiction of capitalism. Right? Those are kind of fighting words for if you're a sort of pro-free market guy like me. The central con contradiction of capitalism, because he says this is going to lead to an endless egalitarian spiral. And his argument is that, well, G, the growth rate of the economy, is how fast labor income is going to grow. And if you're a wealthy guy, and you're just leaving your pot of money growing there at rate R, well, R is the rate of return that your money is going to grow. And therefore, if R is bigger than G, then your pot of money is going to be growing faster and faster than labor income, and all of a sudden you're going to get wealthier and wealthier relative to these, the poor workers. So the capitalists are going to take over the world relative to the workers. That's the endless egalitarian, inegalitarian spiral that he talks about. But I think that's more wrong than right. Now, why do I think that? Well, let's imagine you are a rich, super rich guy. You hit the jackpot, you have your $50 million, $100 million. And you say to yourself, I want to make sure that every one of my descendants is always going to be wealthy. Forever after, the Mankiw family will be wealthy. What issues do you face leaving money to your descendants? One problem is they might spend it. You give, them, you give your heirs some money, they're going to spend it. What's the marginal propensity to consume out of wealth? Well, the literature had this whole consumption literature on this. Numbers tend to be three to five percent. I'm going to be conservative here and say three percent. So you, you give your kids ten million dollars, and they may spend three hundred thousand a year out of that ten million dollars that you give them. It's a, sort of a plausible estimate. In addition to that, you're going to have more than one kid, probably. Most people have two. It's a typical number of family size, and as a result, your wealth doesn't get split up in half every generation, unless you believe in primogenitor, so you ignore your second kid. But most people split their money e evenly. And what does that mean? Well, if a generation, if, you're, if the money's being halved every generation, because they're splitting it in half, and two, two kids, and a generation lasts 35 years, then on average, your wealth per descendant is falling by 2% per year. And then there's that nasty thing called taxation. You're a wealthy guy passing money on to your heirs. There's a 40% federal estate tax. In Massachusetts, where I live, there's another 16% state estate tax. You're paying 56% every generation. Um, if you serve sort of, sort of money halves because of the estate tax every generation, that's, again, losing 2% per year. There's probably additional capital taxes that you're going to pay during, during your lifetime, tax on dividends, interest, capital gains. So it's probably more than 2%. But I'm being conservative here again. Let's say you're losing only 2% per year to taxation. So 3% to consumption, 2% to, to procreation, and 2% to taxation. What does that mean? It means that for, to get Piketty's endless egalitarian spiral, we don't need R bigger than G. We need to be R to be bigger than G by 7 percentage points. And that is very unlikely. New York, Piketty estimates that R on a, is about 4 or 
That sounds plausible to me, about 5%, on a balanced port- normal balanced portfolio. G in the U.S. economy has been about 2 to 3%. Let's say it's slower going forward, it's only 2%. So yes, R is bigger than G, but it's not bigger than G by 7. So as a result, it seems very unlikely to me that either in the past, which is not really what he's talking about, he's talking about the future, it seems very unlikely to me that we're going to have a future in which R is going to be bigger than G by more than 7 percentage points, and that Piketty's endless egalitarian spiral uh, will, will um, occur. If you want to hear more about this, by the way, I'm in the process of drafting a paper on the Piketty book, uh, which I'll pl- po- post on my Harvard website and mention on my blog in a few weeks. It's being presented at the AEA meetings, for those of you who are going, in early January. A, I've, I've organized a session of the Piketty book where I'm presenting as well, along with Alan Auerbach and Kevin Hassett and David Weil from Brown, and then Piketty will be there to respond. So if you, if you want to hear a discussion of this issue, it should be a fun time. <laughs> okay. So those are the two, fo- two false narratives. I told you a bunch of things I think are true and, and some of the s- stories that people tell I don't think are true. Let me turn now fra- from um, the facts, the hypotheses, to now talking about what, what might policymakers do about this. The first thing you might think about is addressing the root causes, which is why it's useful to have hypotheses in mind about what the root causes are before you think about addressing them. And the first thing you realize is that a lot of these root causes are pretty hard to address. It's hard to change the course of technology. It'd be nice if technological progress could increase the demand for unskilled workers, but we don't really control exactly the form of technological progress. It would be a bad idea to reverse globalization. I basically believe that Ricardo was right about the theory of comparative advantage, so we don't want to go down that route. And we're probably not going to reverse assorted mating. I don't think we're going to have a policy that's going to tell the investment banker to marry the poet. Uh, People are going to marry who they're going to marry, and assorted mating is probably a thing that's going to um, probably occur as much today as in the future, in the future as it is today. So those are things pretty hard to change. What we can do is try to increase the supply of skilled workers. So in this race between education and technology, you can give a little goose to education. And how can we do that? Well, we can work on the educational system through things like pre-kindergarten. And this is one of the times I do think the Obama administration is on the right track. Uh, Jim Heckman has... The University of Chicago has done a lot of work on the importance of pre-kindergarten education, especially for uh, underprivileged kids, because it helps them develop non-cognitive skills. And that's not just learning to read early, but developing the ability to take direction, to self- exhibit self-control, to, to, to play well with, with others and respect authority. So the variety of non-cognitive skills is developed early on. This, this question of how to make higher education more widely affordable, Luigi Zingales. Uh, finance economists has argued that we should think about equity financing of college degrees. It's very risky for a student to take out college loans because he, college, as in any investment, it's risky. And if and a loan is, is, a, is a fixed obligation, it's, actually hard to, it's particularly hard to uh, get rid of in, in bankruptcy. So it's really quite a risky thing for a person to take out large student loans for, for higher education. But we solve that problem all the time in other, in other environments where we have equity investors. Why not equity invest, investors for higher education? So, for example, some investor comes in and says, I will pay for your four years at Harvard, and then I get 2% of your income for the next 30 years. And the IRS could even help that out because the IRS gets the date on the income, so they could, they, could, they could help enforce the contract. The equity investor would then have an incentive to tell you what courses to take. Take the economics course. Folklore mythology? No, don't major in folklore mythology. We actually do have a folklore mythology major at Harvard. Um, small one, fortunately. Uh, economics major is a big one. But the equity invest, if he's got 2% stake in your future, he's going to tell you what's the useful thing to take, what nice useful thing to take. So you have somebody who's really there giving advice uh, to students. And the simplest way to increase the supply of skilled workers is to let more skilled workers into the country. Why it's hard, I mean, Silicon Valley people have said a lot about this recently. To, from my perspective as, a, as an educator, when I, when I see all these talented students from abroad coming at the beginning of their Harvard degrees, we should encourage every single one of them to stay. We should sort of give them their green card as they're leaving the, the diploma. Um, it's like, that's, it's, to me, that seems like a no-brainer as a public policy concern. Um, now, most of the debate about inequality is really not addressing the root causes in part because it, these are hard things to do. Educational reform is really hard. Saying we should have a better educational system is easy to say. Getting it is hard. Also, it's not going to change overnight. Even if you do have a better educational system, changing the educational 
profile of the workforce is a generation-long task. That shouldn't stop us from doing it. There be this in increase in inequalities happened since the 1970s. It's taken a generation or two to get where we are. So not surprisingly, it'll take us a generation or two to get back. Uh, so we should start now rather than later. But people tend to want to look for quicker fixes. And that usually involves treating the symptoms rather than the causes. And that has to do with the system of taxes and transfers, which is what I want to talk, talk about now. This shows you the progressivity of the tax. This is the federal tax rates, including all federal taxes, as estimated by CBO. So this is um, income taxes, payroll taxes, corporate income taxes, paid for by different parts of the income distribution. Uh, you can see that we have a progressive tax system. People at the top pay higher taxes than people at the bottom, despite what Warren Buffett might say about himself and his secretary. That those anecdotes that, you, some, that Mr. Buffett likes are basically more uh, wrong than right. We have a progressive tax system. Um, it's always been progressive. The degree of progressivity does change over time. Uh, you can see that in the 86, tax rates, the top 1% were low after the Reagan tax reform. Now they're kind of high by historical standards. But one thing to notice here is that the changes here are small compared to the changes in before tax income. Remember, I said the top 1% doubled their share of income, 100% increase in their share of income. They doubled their share of income. These changes in tax rates are like 5 10%. So whether you think the Obama tax policy is great or the Reagan tax policy is great, that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things compared to what we've seen before tax incomes I showed you earlier. So we can debate about this, but we're really sort of missing the big picture if this is really what you're focused on. Okay, what is the optimal tax system? How progressive should this be? How high should tax rates go? The first thing to say about this is that is a normative question. One of the, things, the first things I teach in economics, Act 10 at Harvard, is what's the difference between a normative statement and a positive statement, and the basic philosophical premise that you can't go from is to ought. The only way to go from is to ought is to bring in a per, some per personal political philosophy. You can't just, as a matter of economics, say what the tax system should be. Whenever you see an economist talking about tax reform, there's probably a bit of political philosophy sneaking in, in there, especially if they're talking about the optimal degree of progressivity. Now, the dominant political philosophy among economists is utilitarianism, which goes back to Jeremy Bentham, the famous, famous utilitarian philosopher, the idea that the goal of public policy is to maximize total happiness in society, total utility in society. Economists like that because our tools are really well suited for this political philosophy, right? People maximize subject to constraints, firms maximize profits subject to constraints. What does a social planner do? What does a good tax planner do? They maximize social welfare subject to constraints. So it just fits in our intellectual framework. But it is a political philosophy. Here's Jeremy Bentham, by the way. A uh, quick story about Jeremy. Uh, when he died, he wanted his body preserved. Because he thought being wheeled out of faculty meetings would provide utility to his colleagues. So this is Jeremy Bentham after his death. Um, it turned out, though, they didn't do a good job of preserving the body. Um, so the head fell off. So they replaced it with a wax head. That's the wax head you see there. The real head is the one you see at his feet. Um, so they kept there for a while. They decided that didn't work ever out very well, though, this particular situation, because the students, at, I think it's University of College London, if I recall, the students would break in and steal the head as a prank. So now the head is um, in a vault somewhere. Jerry Bentham is still available to see, but not with the, the real head. Uh, because they want to make... Now, I, know, I guess they thought it was disrespectful that students would steal the real head, but, as I see it, they got utility from stealing the real head, so who knows? I mean, maybe Jeremy would have been perfectly fine with that. I don't know. Just a thought. Anyway, so, so utilitarianism is the, um, is the uh, standard political philosophy that economists turn to in the literature on optimal taxation, and it gives you fairly standard, plausible-sounding results. You, many of you are familiar with this book, Equality and efficiency, the big trade off. And what Arthur Opian did is basically apply utilitarian logic to thinking about this big issue. He said, look, we can try to achieve more equality, and that's a good thing because of diminishing margin utility, but if, the more we try to redistribute, the less people have an incentive to work, and the pie shrinks. So we face a trade off between having slices of equal size and having a big economic pie. And we, we might have differences of opinion about how how steep the trade-off is, how much people respond to incentives. We have different policy preferences about how we care about equality versus efficiency. But this, in Oaken's eyes, was the big trade-off that policymakers faced. And the modern literature basically formalizes Oaken's intuitions and the utilitarian intuitions 
And Jim Murley's won the Nobel Prize for, for the beginning of the formalization of equality and efficiency. Now, what I've been thinking about some of the work I've been doing lately is raising questions about utilitarianism. I have several papers on this. There's a lot of questions you might ask. Is utility interpersonally comparable? How do you know if you're util- you get the same utility I get? In particular, how do we deal with that when people have differences in tastes? You know, people go to school and they should make different choices. Some people go to work for Goldman Sachs. Other people go for Teach for America. That's partly just their different preferences. Maybe the person who went for Goldman Sachs went there because he really, really likes money. And the person who went for Teach for America has other values. Well, if you're a utilitarian, you say, that guy really, really enjoys his money. We shouldn't take it away from him. He's getting a lot of utility from it. <laughs> How do you compare? Maybe the guy for Teach for America doesn't care much about money. So giving it to him, he says, I don't really care that much about money. Thank you very much. But I'm happy to take it. But, you know, I don't get that much utility from it. So if you're really maximizing total utility, how do, you, how do you compare? Is there any scientific way, especially in a world where people have different preferences, to do that? If you take philosophy courses, you'll deal with all sorts of hypotheticals about utilitarianism. Do you believe utilitarianism? Let's give you a flavor for what you learn in a philosophy course. Take Michael Sandel's. I'm going to give you three trolley problems. Trolley problem one. There's a runaway trolley running down a track. It's about to run into three children who are playing on the track. Fortunately, you're standing next to a switch. If you pull the switch, it'll divert the trolley to another track with only one man standing there. Do you pull the switch? Many people say, sure, I'll pull the switch and kill the one man rather than the three children. That sounds pretty utilitarian. Another trolley problem number two. You're standing on a bridge overlooking the track. On runaway trolley, three children. Next to you is a fat man standing on the bridge, too. You can push him off the bridge, onto the track, in front of the trolley, stop the track, stop the trolley from hitting the three children. Do you do it? Some people start getting kind of queasy at that point. You know, I'll pull the switch, but I really don't want to push the fat man. That's a little too personal, a little too close. Trolley problem number three. There's actually no trolley in this one, but you'll see the analogy in a second. You're a physician. You have these three patients sitting in your office. They're all about to die. They need a transplant. One needs a new heart. One needs a new lung. One needs a new liver. Their death is imminent. Then a fourth man, perfectly healthy, walks into your office for his annual checkup. (laughs) At some point, everybody stops being utilitarian. (laughs) Okay. There's, of course, practical questions about utilitarianism. If you believe in the utilitarian logic, where do you apply it? Most people who do this are looking for optimal tax policy in the United States. So Peter Diamond, the Nobel Prize winning economist, has a paper where he, basically applying utilitarian logic, argues that the top marginal tax rate in the United States should be 70% on the ground that the rich get very little benefit from the extra dollars compared to the poor, and as always, she's basically go to the peak at the Laffer curve, roughly, and which he estimates about 70% marginal tax rate. But, it, but shouldn't that logic apply to the United Nations too? Maybe the United Nations should look at the United States, which is rich, and look at Sub-Saharan Africa, which is poor, and say, gosh, the people in Sub-Saharan Africa would benefit a lot more from all that GDP the U.S. has. Maybe the United Nations should apply a 70% tax rate to the United States and ship it all to Sub-Saharan Africa. You don't have economists making that argument. They're willing, they're, they, Peter Nyman seems to be comfortable saying he has 70% marginal tax is fine, to redistribute inside the United States, but I, I, he has not come out, as far as I know, for sort of similar international redistribution. Presumably, Jeremy Bentham wouldn't have said, let's maximize utility, but only within the borders of our country. You, the, the, the utilitarian political philosophy would have been more global in scope. Now, one that I've done some writing on is what's called the economics of tagging. George Akerlof made the following observation some years ago. He said, you know, if we really want to f- pursue an optimal tax policy... We want to do more than just tax income. In particular, there are various, various exogenous characteristics that people have that are correlated with their income. If we can observe these exogenous characteristics that they can't change and tax those characteristics, we're sort of indirectly taxing their income without distorting their incentives and encouraging not to work as hard. And so taxing these tags is, instead of income to some degree might well be part of an optimal tax system. And that, that logic is, is absolutely true. And it got me to write a paper with my colleague, Matthew Weinzerl, who's at Harvard Business School, 
on a paper called The Optimal Taxation of Height. I was actually sitting in a lecture that Steven Pinker, the psychologist, gave. He, he, he noted, really as an offhand way, he wasn't talking about optimal tax policy, but he noted in an offhand way that incomes and height were correlated. Taller people tend to earn more money than, than shorter people. And I said, huh, that's interesting, because that's like a tag in George Akerlof's sense. So if, that, if the Steven Pinker fact is right, and the George Akerlof theory is right, and they both are, then it says that we should tax people according to their height. And so Weinzerl and I got some data on wages and height of people and got a utilitarian tax problem, a very standard utilitarian tax problem. So, okay, if you're a conventional utilitarian, how much are you going to tax height? And we, can, we constructed this table. And this is hard to read. We tried to make this look like a traditional IRS table you might find in the back of your 1040. And it says, if, you are, if your income is closest to this, and you're short, medium, or tall, this is how much your taxes are. So if you look at the bottom left, it says here, if your income, if your income, well, let me look, since you can't see, let me look at the bottom, let me do the top, top right, so people in the back can see. Okay, top right says, if your income is $105,000, and you're short, you pay $33,900, but if you're tall, you pay $38,280. So you pay about an extra $5,000 if you're tall relative to short, for the same income. And that's because taller people would tend to be have higher income and therefore want to sort of shift some of the income, what would have been an income tax toward the height tax. And this follows inexorably from two things. One, the utilitarian social planning problem. Two, the fact that in the data, wages are correlated with height. That's the only thing you need basically to come to this conclusion. And, this, and, and what we did is calibrate the magnitude of these effects given the actual correlations in the data. Now, we weren't proposing this as a real policy. I advised Mitt Romney in the last presidential campaign, and no point did I say, Mitt, we really should put a tax on height. Um, he's tall, by the way, but that was not the reason. We, did, we, we, we wrote this paper as a challenge to utilitarians. We said, okay, you, you believe in utilitarian social planning problems, utilitarian optimal tax policy, then you should believe in this. One of my colleagues in the law school, Louis Kaplow, who's a hardcore community utilitarian, saying, you're right, I do believe in this. That's a good idea, we should do that. But I think most people think, yeah, I kind of believe utilitarians, but this really is a step too far, which suggests there's something in their innate moral intuitions that's not purely utilitarian. I don't know what it is, but, not, but people are not strict utilitarians. Now, of course, if you go to philosophy departments, there are other political philosophies. Right? It's not like every political philosopher is a utilitarian. So let me just sort of mention an alternative. Robert Nozick was a famous libertarian political philosopher, now deceased from Harvard, and here's what he wrote in his famous book. He said, We are not in the position of children who have been given portions of pie by someone who now makes last-minute adjustments to rectify careless cutting. What each person gets, he gets from others who give to him in exchange for something or as a gift. In a free society, diverse persons control different resources, and new holdings arise out of the voluntary exchanges and actions of persons. So this is what he's saying is, if you're Robert Downey Jr. and you make a lot of money because people vol- you, you make a movie and people voluntarily pay you a quarter to see it, no problem. If he makes $50 million, no problem. As long as he didn't deceive them into making, going to see his picture, as long as this is sort of a voluntary transactions, the, the absence of deceit or fraud, there's no problem. We should, we should judge the process, how we got there, but not necessarily the outcomes, which is what utilitarians want to do. So don't think of yourselves as a social planner trying to recut the, the pie due to careless cutting. So to simplify just a little bit, here's my version of Nozick. Nozick says, if you're a good rich guy like Robert Downey Jr., he actually used the example of Will Chamberlain in his book. But if you're, if you're a rich guy that's creating wealth and people want to pay you a little bit because you're creating something they really value, then fine, no problem with them getting wealthy. But if you're doing something that's diverting wealth from other people, like Bernie Madoff did with his illegal Ponzi schemes, then that's a problem. And I think if, I, I, I think if Nozick were here, he'd say, we really need to... I'm not, Bernie Madoff was not bad just because it was illegal, but because it really wasn't creating anything. It was diverting from other people. And indeed, if you look at Michael Lewis's new book, Flash Boys, it's basically about a legal form, a legal form of front-running. And he's basically saying, those guys are diverting money from other people 
Maybe we need new regulations to stop it. But they may not be criminals like Bernie Madoff was, but they're wolf diverters like Bernie Madoff was. And so I think a plausible way of seeing those, like, yeah, we need to worry about the rich guys that are diverting money, but not, not worry about the rich guys that are creating wealth. Now that seems like a very radical view of inequality compared to standard views that economists are used to, the utilitarian view. I actually don't think it's all that different from what the public thinks innately. Why do I say that? Well, do you remember Occupy Wall Street? Do you remember Occupy Silicon Valley? Do you remember Occupy Hollywood? Do you remember Occupy Major League Baseball? No, I don't remember any of those either. <laughs> they didn't exist. It was Occupy Wall Street and only Wall Street. They weren't, they weren't occupying other rich guys. Why would they occupy Hollywood? Well, because they kind of looked at the guys in Hollywood and they say, I kind of understand why he got his $15 million. And it doesn't really bother me. But those Wall Street guys in the aftermath of the financial crisis didn't look like heroes. And so it looked like they were getting rich at other people's expense rather than because they created wealth. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all the empirical judgments of the Occupy Wall Street crowd, but this idea that we may judge different rich guys differently depending on how they got there and, and how it affected other people is, I think, part of their intuition and probably a sensible part of intuition, which is not <coughs> central to the utilitarian calculus that economists are used to. So let me close with this question. Which one of these two people is the typical rich guy closest to? Does a typical rich guy make his money by diverting wealth from other people or by creating wealth for other people? I think this is actually a pretty important question for how people think about inequality. And notice one thing interesting about this question. This is not a question of political philosophy, whether the typical rich guy is more similar to the guy on the top or guy on the bottom. That is a question of positive economics. So in principle, this is a question that we as economists should be able to answer with the tools that we have. Now, I don't know the answer to this question. I have, I have guesses. Other people may have different guesses. Um, you know, Bolzak famously said, behind every great fortune is a great crime. Actually, he didn't really say that, but he's often quoted as having said that. He said something a little more subtle. But I think a lot of people on the left who really want to pay high taxes on the, left, on, on the rich have that sentiment. They, don't, they, they think the rich got rich illegitimately. They're more like Bernie Madoff. Whereas the, the, the people on the right who aren't as worried about high incomes say, no, the typical rich guy is more like Robert Downey Jr., Bill Gates. They're creating wealth. They're creating value for other people. Steve Jobs. Um, and the question of how much of wealth creation at the top is generated by one type or the other type is one that desperately needs answering. And maybe somebody here in this room will eventually figure out a way to answer it. So let me stop there. Say thank you for listening to me. And I'm happy to take questions on anything I said or anything else. Yes, right. Um, so thank you for that talk. Uh, I knew when I saw the slides yesterday it was going to be great, but once the actual person put the slides to life, it was much better than I thought. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions. One is related, they're, they're both related to measurement. One is, what do we actually measure to, to get at inequality? Um, and I'd like to ask you about current income versus permanent income, it, it struck me uh, ever since I read the Sherman Oaks Prison article years ago that, um, you know, when, going back to the Robert Downey analogy, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure there were years when, when uh, Downey was earning only enough money to cover his food and the other substances that he liked to consume. <laughs> and uh, then he, of course, has these insanely flush years. And, you, you know, that's playing out at a smaller scale for, for you know, many uh, of the wealthy, the CEOs. How many years do they get to be CEO? Is it, in fact, as long as a typical NBA superstar gets to play basketball at the professional level? So how would, ever since Milton Friedman came along, we've known that permanent <coughs> income is what really is a more appropriate concept. How does bringing that perspective and change our understanding of the quantitative size of inequality? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Repeat. Well, the question is, well, the basic question is how do we measure income? And in particular, since a lot of people like Robert Downey Jr. have a few good years and then you know, start off as a poor actor and maybe stop being a successful actor. Well, it doesn't seem like he's slowing down yet. But you know, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. So maybe permanent income is more relevant than current income. I agree completely. And that leads you to a view of that maybe consumption is inequality is more important than income inequality. And I'm actually, I didn't bring this up here because it sort of takes me down a different path. I personally am a believer that consumption taxes, for various reasons, are better than income taxes. And if we could have a progressive consumption tax, 
that would be a better way of getting the kind of inequality we deeply care about than, um, than, in, than progressive income tax. Uh, there's various ways to do that. I should note, by the way, that the Tax Foundation had some interesting charts that came out just yesterday or the day before comparing the United States and Europe. And Europe tends to use consumption taxes much more than the United States does. The United States tends to rely on income taxes. Europe tends to rely on consumption taxes. I think there's good reason for that. Europe has higher taxes in general. And if you're going to have high taxes, you've got to figure out how to have fairly efficient taxes. And consumption taxes are just more efficient than income taxes. So I think there's good reason why they've opted for consumption taxes. I think regardless of the level of taxation, consumption taxes are better. And I'd love to see us move in the direction of consumption taxes. There's different ways to do that. One way is sort of wholesale reform of the tax system, um, you know, like placing the in income tax with a VAT plus perhaps a lump sum rebate, which some people have proposed. Uh, there's also more incremental ways of doing that, like staying with the current structure but expanding tax deductibility of savings through IRAs and, and similar vehicles. So I think we have, if you think about the growth of IRAs and 401k plans and so on, we have been incrementally moving toward a consumption tax. Uh, but I, my own view is we, if we move more consciously and faster in that direction, that would be a, that would be a good thing. And if we move to a consumption tax, you'd basically be taxing something closer to permanent income than current income. Yes? Greg, you know that I spend a half of my personal life in Europe and half of the on this side of the ocean. <laughs> the one thing that strikes me, and you did not mention tonight, we have a Although we are completely similar and we have similar political ideas and ideas about our children, whatever, there's no big difference. In well, Europe, it is accepted that estate taxes form a core element of any taxation system. Here, there's an enormous fight. I suppose death taxes and whatever. That's the enormous difference that I see between our system, and that explains part of what, what we all call Mr. Piketty is saying. It's actually Piketty, two teams in one bed. But he is uh, not really emphasizing that thing. But from my experience, it is really, in where I'm from, in Western Europe, a major part of tax. <coughs> and the other one is, uh, <coughs> you mentioned that sales tax are more efficient than income tax. I have to make a little qualifier there. We only have high sales taxes in Europe because Italy could not get itself into establishing a reasonable system of income taxes. That's why we all have to accept a very high level of VAT. But ever since we introduced high levels of VAT, we have seen the consumption growth of the economy falling. And now actually we're in a situation where the total demand side is such that we cannot reach a, a reasonable level of economic growth. So with that, a shortfall in, in, in aggregate demand, we're having a real structural problem that may lead to 10 years of lost growth. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think there's a lot of difference between us in Europe besides the differences in tax structure, and I certainly don't want to emulate Europe in every dimension. So, um, but so, I don't want to go down there too much, but let me say something about the estate tax. Um, here's a sort of a, a, a thought experiment that I like to think about when I think about the estate tax. Two brothers or neighbors um, both uh, start a successful company or make a successful app. They eventually have their liquidity event where they go public and each gets a nice nest egg of $15 million. And, the, and, and then they behave differently. Sam Spendthrift takes his $15 million and starts living the high life, having big parties, big yachts, private jet. Frank Frugal leaves a middle-class lifestyle drives himself around, takes, flies commercial planes, has a little sunfish instead of a yacht, and he wants to leave his money to his children. Do you think that Frank Frugal should pay higher taxes than Sam Spendthrift? Should the government say, you know, we kind of like Sam Spendthrift a lot more than Frank Frugal. He's Frank Frugal's giving his money to his kids, and that's creating unequal opportunity for the next generation. Please, if you make lots of money, spend it on yourself. Don't leave it to the next generation. That's what the estate tax does. Now, to me... I look at those two people and I say, you know, if I admire anybody, I admire Frank, well, I admire Frank Frugal more than Sam Spendthrift. So if I want to tax anybody less, I'd rather tax Frank Frugal less, which a consumption tax would do. This idea that we're going to, ha we're going to tell the guy, no, no, if you, if you make a lot of money, please don't leave it to your kids. Spend it on yourself is not something that I want a tax system to do. But that's a, that's a value judgment. There's a, there's a book by a political philosopher named Fishkin who basically says that 
there's two conflicting values here. One value is equality of opportunity. The other is family autonomy. The family wants to use its resources to improve the lives of, the, of its children. Is that something you object to? Well, if you really care about equality of opportunity above all else, then yes, you do. You don't want people to help their kids with their resources. But if you value family autonomy as a central ideal, then yeah, it's okay when people use their resources to help their children. Sure, we should provide an education system for, for everyone and provide a social safety net for everyone, but we shouldn't tell the lucky guy, please, please spend the money on yourself. But that's a, that's a value that's, that's, that's involved a political philosophy which may be different between me and you and Americans and, and, and Europeans. Yeah, do any students here have any questions? I want, I want a student to have a question. Yes, student question here. Are you open to constructive criticism? Am I open to constructive? No, I, won't, I only want destructive criticism. No, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Constructive. Point taken. Thank you. Question, question there. Yes. Oh, the, the statement was that I use the, the male pronoun too often. I should. I should use. I should. I should switch the pronouns around. In fact, in the latest editions of my textbooks, I've, I've been worried about this issue, and, I, and he or she is so awkward. And my new rule for my textbooks that comes out. The new, the new edition just came out recently. The new rule is that generic people are. She in chapters one, three, five, and all the odd chapters, and he in all the even chapters. Does that help? Yeah, it, it's, it's an enigma to me because I have read your, te- your textbook. Yes. Some, you know, well, like, the new edition, I, I, changed, I went back and I, changed, I went through every single pronoun of the book. So check the newest edition, then check the pronouns. Odd and even chapters. Yeah. So you, did, you didn't explicitly confront the question of what is wrong with, with a great income inequality. But you implied that something was very wrong about equality, inequality by, say, by saying or <coughs> linking inequality to increases in the poverty rate. I'm not sure that's a close linkage that could be shown empirically. So the question is, what's the linkage between why am I concerned about inequality and what's the linkage to the poverty rate? Um, I, I'm more worried about opportunities for people at the bottom than I am for wealth at the top. Right. I, the statement I'm making about linkages between inequality and the poverty rate was really more of a mechanical one, which is that if we have a certain distribution of income and the whole thing shifts to the right, so we have all, everybody has more income, and the variance stays the same, so the same inequality, then more people are going to be pulled above any given threshold. This sort of mechanical statistical problem. Whereas if the whole distribution is moving to the right, so the average income is rising, but the variance is going up, then it's possible that the number of people below that poverty threshold is not, is not falling, even though the average income is rising. So that's really just a mechanical, statistical statement. As a policy matter, when people ask me, are you concerned about inequality? I say, I, think, I find that's not a useful way to pose the issue, because inequality can arise because the rich are getting richer or the poor are getting poorer, and we may care differently about those two different things. And the poor getting poorer, I think, is a problem or the poor not experiencing growth is a problem, the rich getting richer is not a problem in and of itself unless it's causing the poor to get poorer, which in some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. And that's why I get back to wealth diverters and wealth creators um, towards the end. Yes? I have a, a, a point, a, a, a reason for the inequality that you didn't mention I'd like to get your opinion on. Yeah, before 1970 or uh, before 1965, Manufacturing was a big economic driver in the country. There was a sort of knife-like change in slope in the income distribution around 1970, and that coincides with the uh, the uh, unprecedented environmental laws, which focus specifically on manufacturing and industry because they were considered the big hazard for environment. Now, that apparently caused, or this is my thought, uh, business managers and leaders to move to real estate, to finance from manufacturing. And those that stayed had more legal and political risk to deal with. So they may have wanted to reward themselves more. How about those things? Yeah, the the question involved involved, um, the linkage between manufacturing uh, and the decline 
and, and increasing inequality and particular regulation. I think that you're absolutely right that, that there's been a sea change in the role of manufacturing in the economy. I think that, that and for sure, there's m multiple drivers and some of the things you talked about may be part of it. I think a large part of the, the changes in the role of manufacturing has to do with technology. That is, if you look at manufacturing output, we're doing quite well in manufacturing. If you look at manufacturing employment, we're not doing so well. And that's just because manufacturing productivity has risen much faster than productivity in other sectors of the economy. So it's a little bit like what happened a few generations earlier to farming. We produce lots of farm output. We do it with almost no farmers because productivity has been so amazing in farming. That's generally a good thing unless you happen to be a farmer. In which case, the market's going to tell you you shouldn't be a farmer anymore. Similarly, we have a vibrant manufacturing sector producing lots of stuff, but it's producing stuff with more automation, more productivity, fewer workers. And as a result, you're right, a lot of mid-level manufacturing jobs uh, have been lost. And then the question is, where, where do they go to? What's the future of the economy? Um, if people are not going to manufacturing, as far as I can tell, they're all going to healthcare. As we all get older as a society, as, as we get better technologies, probably health, I'm guessing, I'm very, you know, forecasts are bad at forecasting the future, so we shouldn't do it very often. But um, I'm, you know, if I had to say, where the, what's the trends of the economy? Probably smaller role for manufacturing employment and a higher role for uh, healthcare employment over the next generation. Yes, another student question. Yes. We, do you want to defend ways of pronouns? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> First, a comment. Uh, one comment is in terms of experiencing inflation, right? So when you're looking at uh, income earners, uh, generally the Federal Reserve is actually doing research on this as well, they tend to experience inflation very differently. Take, take for example, energy prices. Uh, many Americans drive a car. If you look at energy prices going from 1972, uh, Modern times, it's just exploded. We're choice of worth there, but uh, and oftentimes those in the lower income brackets may spend more of their income on energy-related products relative to those in upper, upper brackets. So that's one potential common suggestion to look at in terms of that. But then the question that I have is uh, actually a very student student-oriented question on the student debt. What is your take on how student loans may constrain the choices that students have? and prevent them from entering the high income uh, earning brackets which tend to require more risk taking and more mobility. Um, uh, the question of different, I mean, with all, with all the data typically are, def are deflated with standard consumer price indices, to the extent that um, people face different price indices, you're right, that could just, just, just distort the picture. I don't know if there's been a lot of work on that. I should say one thing about the energy prices. Uh, I, I've written, this is sort of a different topic that I sometimes talk on. I'm a big believer in higher energy taxes, like higher gas taxes. And I, 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 have, a, I have a whole lecture on that. I can come back sometime and tell you. Um, and one of the questions is, people say, well, higher energy taxes, wouldn't that be really hard on the poor? Well, it turns out, when people look at this, and Jim Viterbo has done the best work on this, the poor do not consume a disproportionate amount of energy. The, because if you're poor, you're probably living in inner city and taking public transportation. Guest taxes hit the middle class hard, for sure. They drive, they live in the suburbs, they drive a lot, but it's not particularly hard on the poor. So I, I think it's probably wrong to think of gas, you know, gasoline prices as being too hard on the poor. And so the issue of student debt, it's, it's an interesting, it's an important phenomenon. Ed, higher education is getting more expensive. The relative price has been going up over time. There's a lot of reasons why that, why that is. Um, we, we could also, which I don't want to spend too much time going to because that's a long story into itself. The question is then how do we deal with it? How do we make higher education more available? And that's why I raised this issue of equity financing. One possibility is to pay, do what a lot of European countries do, which is pay, pay for it more through government subsidies, through the tax system, more public, edu public education. That, I have mixed feelings about that because in part, if you're doing that, you're basically subsidizing people who are already going to be successful in the lifetime sense, a high permanent income, and asking a general taxpayer to pay for it. Right? If you're going to college and getting a degree, and especially a graduate degree, you've probably shown yourself to be in the top third of the income distribution. Um, so why should the general taxpayer fund you? I've often wondered that myself. Like I, I got a PhD in a National Science Foundation fellowship. I remember it, even as a grad student at MIT, telling my fellow recipients of these and I said, fellowships, you know, we really don't deserve this. We're going to do just fine for ourselves. There's no reason the government should be paying for what we're doing. They thought I was a little bit of a crackpot. Um, but, you know, it, from, from a lifetime standpoint, I mean, at the time we had no money. We were just, we, 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 but from a lifetime standpoint, we were going to do fine. Now, 30 years later, they've all done fine. Looking back, backwards, you, know, you wouldn't look at those people and say, boy, that, from a lifetime standpoint, that person really needed a government handout. Alone would have been just fine. Maybe equity would have been better, but there's no reason 
it's that the general taxpayer needed to pay for our, our higher education. Yes? So I have a quick two questions. Um, the first one is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I do think that the term equality and equality is a little bit vague in the sense that there's no yeah, two things absolutely. that are equal. Uh, shouldn't we be talking about equality before the law? Rather than you know inequality in, in, in this big term of you know not having the same income as other or, or things like that. And my second question is, um, what role? I mean, you spoke about Robert Nozick and uh, you know the, the analogy with Robert Downey and Bernie Madoff. Uh, what role does um, government, our own government, granting uh, privileges to uh, to special companies or friends or? have been creating this inequalities? Um, the, the first question is, what, what, what do we mean by, by equality and inequality? I mean, this, the literature that I'm talking about is about inequality of outcomes. But you're absolutely right, and there's other things we may care about. We may care about equal rights. And I think where Nozick was about, is about a certain kind of equality. It's about, equal, as he said, equality before the law, um, but not necessarily equality of, of outcomes. Uh, I mean, your second question was, what role? Uh, oh, oh uh, the government granting grants. Yeah, you know, I, in some countries, crony capitalism is a big deal. When I see rich oligarchs in Russia leaving with billions of dollars, or I see you know these estimates that Putin's worth many billions of dollars. One well, didn't have the sense that he's like an entrepreneur, like Bill Gates, creating so much value for the Russian people that they're all happy to pay him with fifty cents um, or whatever it is to, to add, add up to his billions. Uh, that he got it in a different way, in a way that probably we wouldn't put up with this country. Right? If, if, if somebody was president for a few years and somehow managed to leave with a billion dollars, I mean, not been a billionaire before they went in, I, don't, I think the American people would not put up with that. Uh, I, so I don't think we have the, I mean, I'm sure we have crony capitalism to a degree. I'm sure we have, like, you know, subsidies to, you know, to, to certain industries, you know, whether it's pr protection of corn, of corn farmers or not letting sugar, cheap sugar in from Caribbean and so on. This, 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 people do get, have special benefits, but I don't think it's nearly as rampant as it is in some countries around the world. Yes, in the back there. Last question. Last question. Okay, it's got. To, is it a good question? This is the last one. You're on the spot. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to push you against professions. So you gave your example of Robert Downey Jr. Uh, versus Bernie Madoff. Given that most of the spending in the healthcare sector is by the government, and that doctors help choose the rates at which they're paid based on premiums for physicians versus primary care. Two earners, both doctors, who are top 1%, living in Bethesda and working at NIH, do you feel that given our system, they're closer to Robert Downey Jr. or Bertie Mayo? <laughs> My own view? I mean, I think, I think the healthcare system has lots of, the question whether the doctors are more like Bernie Madoff or more like Robert Downey Jr. I think there's a lot of wealth creation in the medical industry. The question is whether what the right prices should be and how the prices should be set. It's a compl that's a complicated issue. But I feel like when they, when they are performing a service, they're, doing, they're creating value for you. Uh, when I go to the doctor, I feel like they're creating value. Um, I, I, harder case to answer is the typical guy in, in Wall Street. How do you estimate the social value of a typical guy in Wall Street? I think that's a really hard question. I said on the—I don't want to mention the name of the organization, but I'm, I'm on the—I'm on a um, board of trustees of a of a nonprofit organization, and I have to be sitting on the investment committee. And I tried to argue that this investment committee really shouldn't be spending their money hiring these expensive Wall Street guys. Hmm. That they should just say, take take take, you know, figure an asset allocation, 60 40 bonds or something, 60 40 60 stocks, 40 bonds. Go to Vanguard, stick it in there, and tell their one of their employees to rebalance once a year. But no, no, they decided instead to spend money to hire one of these Wall Street guys, basically because they don't trust themselves to do something simple, like you know, Vanguard mutual fund at five basis points. Instead, they're going to go spend much, much more uh, to, to, to pay a, a professional who knows how to watch their money carefully. The irony of this is I'm the conservative on this board. Everybody else on this board is a bunch of liberals. But they're the guys who don't trust themselves to invest their money, so they're paying some Wall Street guy to do it for them and enriching the guy in the process. I tend to think that a lot of the stuff on Wall Street is that way, where people are way overpaid. These consumers are duped. I'm a big fan of Jack Bogle, for example. A typical person out there should be pay, investing in index funds. Anybody who's paying 100 basis points and a 6% load is basically being duped by somebody on Wall Street. 
how to get that system, how, how prevalent that is on Wall Street, how, 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 how to say how much of these, I mean, some of the people on Wall Street are clearly doing good stuff, right? If you're a private equity firm and you're reorganizing the country, you're like the social planners of the economy. You're deciding what industries are going to grow, what are going to shrink. Right, you're just, so you're doing a really important, you're, you're allocating capital, and there's nothing more important in a capitalist system than allocating capital. So, we'll, so some guys on Wall Street are doing really valuable stuff, but some guys are kind of just ripping people off. How to tell one from the other, measure the relative size of these different groups, and get rid of one kind while not killing the other is a tricky endeavor that's worth doing, but we've got to do it very, very carefully, because mistakes here can be very costly. Let me end right there. Thank you all for listening. It's been a great honor to speak to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. In the name of the National Economist Club, I want to thank everybody for attending and making this night a wonderful evening that will be in the memory of the club. Thank you, Greg, for a wonderful talk. Thanks, everybody. Please drive safely, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.